So we will start, I guess. So hi, everybody. My name is Sebastian. I'm very pleased to be here in Ukraine. For me, it's the very first time at Java Day Kiev, the very first time in Ukraine. And today I'm going to talk about Java EE and why it is the most lightweight enterprise framework. So um, yeah, a little bit about myself in the beginning. Um, I'm a freelancer based in Munich, Germany. I'm a Java developer, consultant, architect, whatever you call it. Um, I'm participating in the JCP, so I'm a, a so-called JAXRS expert group member. So I help defining the, the JAXRS standard for the new Java EE8 version. Um, I'm also a so-called Java champion and a regular conference speaker, basically. And yeah, there were all of the slides I have today because, you know, slides are boring and we want to do live coding and uh, real stuff and discussions. So actually, I'm curious, who of you thinks that Java EE is somewhat heavyweight? Hands up. Yes, at least one. Uh, two, yeah, don't be shy. Okay, so, so why it is? Um, ju just um, shout out some, some things which you consider heavyweight. Is it... What is it what makes Java E heavy, heavyweight? <laughs> okay, EJBs, enterprise containers, application servers. Okay, what else? Containers in general. Okay, okay. So we will see um, if that's true. So um, what I want to do, I want to have some discussions with you. So if you have any questions in all time, or especially if you disagree, just um, shout it out and, and let me know. Um, I will just uh, live code something. And while we're doing that, we, we will discuss about if it's heavyweight or not. So of course, we, we have the game of Java. right? So this is um, a Maven project I just created and um, it looks like this so this is a helper um, bash script I wrote it's something like a maven archetype just to to showcase something because everything I'm showing you I want to show from scratch so that there is no magic I didn't prepare anything up front it's just we will do it uh, all together so this is um, a Java e project created by maven who of you has been using maven in production Okay, so you probably um, game of Java. So I'm just opening this um, using IntelliJ, and I want to show you what we're doing here. So hi, IntelliJ. Is it working? Let's see. Let's do it the old way. Game of Java. Here it is. Okay, so we um, just opened that, newly opened that Maven project from scratch. And what it is, I want to show you, it's basically one of the simplest um, Java E projects you can get. Because you have a lot of dependencies with uh, Maven all the time, but all we want to do here is this. It's one dependency to the Java EE 7 API. This one is provided. This is very important. I'll tell you more about that later. And we're using Java 8. And that's it. And this Maven artifact is not getting any bigger for the production side. So for the production dependencies, we uh, won't expand that any further. And we have two small things to configure. One is uh, the JAXRS configuration. We will use JAXRS uh, here. So this is all you need. You need to bootstrap the application class. And the second thing is a beans XML, we wouldn't even need that. This could also be empty. It could be just an empty file. And the reason why we're doing this is to discover all uh, beans so we can inject all CDI managed beans there. And why am I showing you this? Because this is all you need for configuration. And that's it. You know, don't need any further configuration classes. The assumption that you need somewhat XML in Java E is no true anymore. You don't even need a web XML. So the reason for the JAXRS configuration is it um, implies that a servlet, the JAXRS servlet gets configured, and you don't even need a web XML, and that's it. And yeah, talking about uh, JAXRS, we will um, include a JAXRS 
class. So uh, talking about Game of Thrones, and we have some houses, right? The great uh, houses. So we have a houses resource, which will be obviously uh, a JAXRS resource. Who of you has been using JAXRS in projects? Oh, what's that? So we have houses, and this obviously will end up as a houses uh, resource. And the nice story about this, it will automatically be available as a REST resource in HTTP without any further configuration. So these two classes, together with the Bootstrap classes, all you need, like at all, to have a REST project up and running with Java E. And yeah, le let's um, code something more. So let's code a so-called house, right? Oops, we don't a new um, class called house. This will be just the um, Java Pojo, so we have probably a name, right, with uh, all of these houses have names. And yeah, when you watch the uh, Game of Thrones, you, you notice that a lot of uh, people die um, constantly, so we have to uh, uh, keep track of all the people who, who died so far in the house, otherwise it will be too much, you know? And so just some getters and setters, and uh, to string method because we need that later and just to be convenient um, a custom constructor so that's pretty much it um, the poacher we want to deal with in our application and then we I want to show you um, where Java EE actually shines and the reason why it's um, productive and usable very easily is that the specifications work together really nicely so we, um, I will show you something which is called a JSON array. It comes from JSONP, Java API for JSON processing, and it works together with JAXRS without any configuration. So the nice thing is if you want to have a list of all houses, so you want to get this resource houses, resources slash houses, it will return these, um, obviously from an EJB, or a CDI uh, managed bean. So this is the, the talk. I will talk about that uh, more later. Um, whether you want to use EJBs or CDIs, actually, spoiler, it doesn't matter really for your development uh, uh, workflow. Um, but obviously, you want to inject some component who then makes uh, deals with all these houses and maybe loads them from a database and so on and so forth. Um, I just call that game of Java. And this will be either an EJB or just the CDI managed bean. The difference is minimal just if you put that stateless annotation or not. And the difference is uh, just you will get some things for free like transactions, like management, like interceptors if you need them. And if you do the same with CDI, then actually everything is just the same. You can also use all these things. You would just probably need a few annotations more like at, uh, at transactional and so on and so forth. But um, the difference is, or actually the same, the, the similarity is, you could also add inject them, no matter if it's an EJB or a CDI managed bean or everything, or actually also a bean we um, define ourselves, uh, which I'll show later. So you can use it just straight away, which is very nice because the developer productivity and the developer experience is very good overall by using all these specifications. Um, so anyway, we will call our EJB to please give us um, the houses and therefore it will be a list of house, right? And just to showcase this, so normally obviously it would be um, loaded from a database and so on and so forth, but now we would just uh, create it. So we have a name um, like gray Java, right? And another house, um, for example, Java EE Nister. And just as an example, because um, we want to focus on this side here. And how to use this JSONP here. So now we got a list of POJOs, right? And using Java E7 with Java 8, what I showed in the beginning, we can also make use of uh, nice lambdas and streams and all the goodness that comes with Java 8. So we will use this, and then we will map a house to a JSON object by calling json.createObjectBuilder, which uh, gives us a nice um, builder pattern-like functionality. And then we can do like the same thing 
and to create our JSON with the maximum uh, um, of um, complexity or control. So actually we can control our JSON output in a very easy way because we have this uh, programmatic approach. I'll talk about that uh, later. What do we have? Names and devs. So this is now um, a stream of JSON objects, right? And then we collect this into um, and JSON array, which will be then returned from our JAXRS resource um, at JSON. And of course, uh, as I said, as we're using nice Java 8 features, we can make use of uh, all the fancy things here, like a method references and so on and so forth. And now we would just return this, and that will be the response in our JAXRS resource. Any questions on this so far? Yes. Yes. So it's, um, the question was if it's possible to return just a simple list of objects. Yes, it is, totally. And uh, this would be uh, the simplest approach for this. Um, but actually, I want to um, extend it further and modify the JSON output further. Because this, uh, this is um, probably what you have in your real-world project very easily, that your transfer objects don't match one-to-one -to, -one to your business entities in your um, database, for example, right? Even for the most simplest example. Um, later that day, I'm also talking about hypermedia REST, and therefore we need the same functionality to have full control over the JSON output. And this is a very nice um, thing, which, and that is the point, comes shift with Java EE7. So let's do this, and let's code another method, like create a new house, right? And this comes from, from JSON as well. So what we have that our JAXRS resource will consume JSON data, which we will tell by media type application JSON. And then we can add a new house um, as a request body. So the client will send us a new house as JSON data. And now, again, another nice integration is bean validation. Have you used bean validation before? Um, the nice thing is in Java EE, or actually in JAXRS, it comes integrated with JAXRS. So if you put add valid to that house, that house is automatically being validated. For example, if you say um, that's not supposed to be null, the name, and it has to be some whatever um, size, it's not meant to be uh, zero and so on and so forth, or you could do some uh, regex pattern matching. And by death, of course, uh, the same. And this will automatically be validated, and the nice story is, if it's not valid, then the client will automatically get HTTP 400 bad request. So the integration plays very well, that you don't need to configure it, it will automatically be correct per default, convention over configuration. And Game of Java, create house. So let's just do uh, this, and by return, type void in a JAXRES method, it will uh, tell us 204 um, no content. So this is actually the, the, the right response here as well. If you just accept it and say, I'm the server, that's fine, then it's uh, not supposed to be 200 OK, rather than a different status code, which also tells um, that everything is fine. And just, yeah. Um, return this here, new house. Oops. Any questions so far? All right. So then, let's. Um, uh, well, before we run the example, let's do another nice thing. So, talking about that bean validation, if you have some. Um, extra logic, which is very often the case that you say, I want to um, validate my name not just by a pattern, but for example, I want to look up in the database if that name has already been there or not. So um, let's say it's um, house name not taken or something. And this will now be um, a custom constraint, um, validation constraint, house name not taken which will be, so this is um, bean validation now, the bean validation annotation, which I just created, 
and let's call it house name not taken validator. And this will be an, a bean validation validator class, which um, string, yes, string, the nice thing is also integrates well within the Java E umbrella. So what can we do if we want to look up on the database? We don't have to do it here, but we can also now reuse an either um, CDI managed bean con a component or an EJB again, let's say our Game of uh, Thrones again, and then ask um, our business um, facade um, whether this is taken or not. Is house um, taken? And then let's say return Java equals the string. Right? And then if it's um, taken, if it's not taken, then it's valid, and so on and so forth. And now you could extend it further and say, with this uh, validator context, you can send custom messages to our validation, um, and so on and so forth. The nice story is that you can use it here right away without, uh, without yeah, configuration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From uh, such a validator? Yes, then it would be a validator not only by the um, house name, but by the complete house. That's also possible. Then this uh, type would be a house, and you would put the, um, this annotation on that method. So you would say valid house, for example. That's also possible. That's even easier if you need more um, uh, properties of the whole house. Yeah, very good question. Any other questions for, uh, to that example? Nope, then I will just uh, run it. If I didn't forget anything, of course, this is live coding, so everything can happen. Um, as this is a Maven project, we will call Maven Clean Install to build it. I will talk about that more later, why I'm using this. Um, actually, this is just a default. You can use Maven Package, which is even faster, and you don't even need to clean it, so you can just call Maven Packet. But you know, see, faster than I could talk, this already built um, two seconds, and this thing here is. Uh, Five, five and a half years old, so actually it's, it's very fast. And the reason is that we don't need any uh, third-party dependencies, and I'm talking about that uh, more later. And we will deploy it to Whitefly. This is just a script which takes my WAR file off the target and deploys it to my locally installed Whitefly, and just because it's faster than I could type. And it's already uh, started, and very, uh, very fast. Seven seconds, well, not that fast, maybe. And we can now uh, use any um, REST client of our choice to access this, to showcase. I will use curl, but or whatever. You could use Postman or some, um, some other REST client game of Java. The resources, that was the um, JAXRS application. And houses. Houses. Yep. And we can pretty print this. So we have two houses here. And this is just uh, used by... Um, by everything within the Java E7 API. So now we want to create a new house, right? And we have, let's say, content type. It was application JSON. And content type. And now we have a new house, let's say, with the name um, gray Java. I know this has already been there, but let's do just something which is valid for now. And this, and now it says, well, exception, because this is actually a good example, because everything will fail as well when you live, uh, when live code. Unrecognized fields, yeah. I misspelled it, of course, and now it works. And you can see, if you show the header, two or four, no content. And now, um, Let's do something which gets rejected, bad request, because the depth is null, um, zero. And here, this works again. And if we, that was the um, check in our EJB, if we put the name which has already been taken, then it's the same story. And this was now validated our, uh, via our custom logic, which was injected in the validator with the EJB, yes. Uh, in your uh, console, you run full profile. For I run the full profile of Wildfly. Yes, 
And I will talk about the deployment uh, later, if, uh, if you wait a few minutes. And the reason is because it's fast enough. And it's actually um, usable and very productive to use the full profile. I will also talk about the micro profile in initiative uh, later, but as you saw, just for your normal development workflow, if you go with the zero dependency approach, you're very fast and very productive. And you don't, I would say you as a developer no, don't need to care whether it's a full profile or a minimized profile or a standalone jar. Um, I will talk about that in a minute. So if you disagree, that's very good, so we can have a, a short discussion. Um, and let me just um, finish the API examples on, on Java E. Yeah? Just one more question. Uh -huh. um, is there some message, uh, some validation message? Because I didn't see it. Mm -hmm. What does it return? Not here, but you could uh, add it if you want. Oh, that, so, that, that, um, that's what I wanted to ask. Yeah. Um, what you could do, you could add a um, custom constraint validation um, message in your validator. So if you have this, this context uh, object, then you get um, um, a message template and you can actually um, also build your own constraint vi uh, violation with custom uh, templates and messages and so on and so forth. And if you want to use, um, for example, which is a good um, advice to use a special HTTP header field like error, and then you can uh, return that in your error. So in order to do this, you would uh, have to have an, uh, an um, exception mapper from JAXRS. So a JAXRS exception mapper, which uh, uh, um, takes all the, what's the name, Con constraint validation, violation exception, validation exceptions. Mm, that's the name, let me just check. Violation exception, I always get the name wrong. Yeah, constraint violation exception. Catch these exceptions, and via these exceptions, you get all the violations. And within the violations, you then have access to the messages and to the properties which uh, uh, cause the violations and so on and so forth. And they can you build all your custom stuff you want to return from your REST service or from basically all, every, uh, everywhere where you catch that exception. So that's very easily uh, possible. Um, any other questions? What uh, HTTP code will be returned? Runtime exceptions? Yes. Yes. So per default, if there are some, then JAXRS will just call, uh, uh, just return 500, like an internal server error. Uh, fair enough. If you want to do um, uh, your own exception handling, then it's the same story. You just uh, register an exception handler uh, via JAXRS or via EJB or on, on which level you want to uh, um, catch these exceptions and then just deal with them like this. Or use an EJB interceptor and so on and so forth. All right, um, back to our JAXRS resource. Um, what else is there? Um, what I could show you, so actually the integration within all the specification works really nicely for developers, and that's the whole story. And the main reason for that is CDI. So CDI acts like a glue to glue all these um, components together, and especially add inject. You can add inject all uh, your stuff everywhere. Uh, another example is um, CDI events. So if you want to have like asynchronous or just decoupled events uh, when a new um, house has been created, for example, let's call it new, new house. And then when a new house is created, we, we just call new house fire and the house that has been created here, which then, um, is accessible via, uh, like, let's call it new house listener. Um, so we have this observer here, observes um, on a new house. And this again um, decouples new house arrived, new house already several people died. Um, and now you can decouple this logic here from, from your other components. And what is also possible, you can have asynchronous events 
not yet via CDI, but um, this will uh, probably and hopefully be improved for Java E8. But again, it's a very simple thing to do for developers, whether you choose to have CDI or EJB. So for some um, points, it, for some aspects, it's not yet possible to fully replace EJB, but actually the overhead of EJBs is just neglectable. And the things you get for free so, uh, very often help you just um, to get stuff done. And for, this is a good example, and transactions is another one where you can just use it um, right away to implement asynchronous behavior. And for example, if it takes a while to here create uh, these um, new houses, let's say that takes two seconds. Um, Park Nanos is just like thread sleep without the exception. And then you can use this uh, here right away, which I will show you. So we, we just rebuild it and redeploy it by a Maven clean install and redeploy it on our server. And that actually, this is the reason why I just mostly don't care about being the full profile or not, because you see, um, yeah, redeployed. But I will talk about your um, thing in a second. So if we have um, a valid thing, oh, actually, it was um, too fast, but you see, here, um, it's a different th thread now. But actually, we can skip uh, most EGP uh, annotations by using uh, Delta Spike library, for example. Transactional already yes. present here, yes. and I guess Antichronos will be also present in some time. Yeah, that's, that's totally true, and Delta Spike is a very good example. But still, I would argue, and I will um, talk about some um, third-party dependencies, Delta Spike is a pretty good one, pretty good dependency to have, but at the same time, you probably don't necessarily need Delta Spike if you go with a plain EE approach. Because what do you save? You save a few um, annotations, right? And the things you have probably like uh, configuration, oh, I can show you configuration as well, um, are, well, usable very easily. And you can write one class to have the same functionality and then you, you save uh, but actually, then you can uh, run on micro profile without this full on even web profile with Delta Spike. You don't need AGB, GMS, and so on and so on. You just need CDI. Yeah, just that's true. S and if, um, if you care about having um, the application server or your runtime as small as possible, and you really want to go with a micro a profile approach, then you can use this to, to get rid of, uh, if you really want to get rid of EJBs. But um, my point is actually if it's really needed for, for the default uh, project. It, it probably depends on, on the scope of your whole project. So if you say for some reason you can't go with a micro profile, for example, you need more uh, JPA or other specifications which are then not there or which are not there in that runtime, and you get, uh, go with the full profile or with some profile which includes that, then you know it doesn't matter. But you're totally right. You just have to... Um, see what is available that there, but I would say the benefit in mostly is not that big. That's that's just my my talk. Uh, but uh, but yeah, actually let's um, let's actually um, inject something which is configured. So we will uh, just create one new class um, configuration exposer, which then probably guess it uses uh, CDI to have. Um, a custom producer, this time the CDI one, and returns a string. Suppose, what was that? Configuration. And now you can use the so-called um, injection point to, th this will actually now create your um, beans which can be injected later. So this actually creates the configuration for that one here. And the reason why I'm showing you is that you now can have something, some custom logic to create your configuration. And you could actually do whatever you like. So having this injection point actually gives you the runtime information where that was injected. So it tells you in which class was it injected and what, what is the name. And actually, if you um, have some um, custom annotations, then you can use this um, as well. 
And while we are doing that, then you have the full control over your configuration. So imagine you have a properties file, and you want to have the lookup in that property file with your application configuration um, per runtime, dynamically. You can do this in just this class. You have a single point of responsibility, and you look up um, all your properties um, using the logic I'm writing right now, and then you can um, produce all kind of strings, all kind of configuration. But also you can use such stuff for injecting some parameters in your, inside your uh, producers. Yes. Yeah. That's true. Um, so if you ask the injection point, give me the member. For example, give me the declaring class. And then you say, I'm, I'm just writing this so you get the idea what kind of information um, you get. And then you could look this up, for example, from a properties file or so on and so forth. And it's the same story when, if you're using Spring, like add value with some um, name. You could uh, use your custom um, configuration annotation and then just use it right away. It's the same story like um, from Delta Spike, but if for some reason you don't want to add another dependency, you know, it's just one class. And then you can use, and this is the reason why, who was the question before, uh, why I'm using JSONP here for a programmatic approach. So if you want to use um, some custom JSON, you can do this here and add um, the configuration there. Um, any questions on that? Okay, um, then we just use this example again, which calls all the houses. Oops. And now you have the configuration here, which has our class. And then this is just a key, which could be uh, looked up from, uh, from some configuration. And you can use some dynamic logic in your exposer method here. And this is just exposed via CDI. So this is how you integrate uh, that. Um, yeah, that's basically it on the API side. So long story short, the nice thing is, of, of Java E in general, that the Java EE umbrella um, has several specifications in there, like EJB, CDI, JAXRS, JSONP, and so on and so forth. And the nice thing opposed to other lightweight frameworks is that the umbrella says these specifications have to work well with each other nicely without needing to configure anything. Because the specification says something like, well, if your application server supports JAXRS and supports JSONP, for example, or Bean validation, it has to make sure all these three work together nicely without any configuration. And that is the, exactly the reason why we can use add valid here and the bean validation method gets invoked. It's the same thing like if you would add inject the validator and then say validate. Or um, the same story as JSONP works out of the box. So it knows about JSON arrays and knows what to do. It's the same thing as you would have your list of POJOs like um, done um, manually. And that is actually the reason why I consider the de um, development model and the developer's experience like one of the best through all in all enterprise frameworks if you're using Java EE. Disagreements? No? OK. Yes. Uh, actually, I think that biggest problem of uh, enterprise Java is uh, footprint when we uh, develop some solution, uh -huh. we need uh, not only uh, prepare a jar or YAR file, but also uh, have maintenance with our servers, for example, Whitefly or whatever. And it's the biggest problem in uh, enterprise Java, because, for example, with Spring Boot, you just run a jar file and don't care about any servers or whatever. Yeah. Uh, you need only your jar file. That's, that's all. Yes. And actually, I come to this topic just right now. And I, I will tell you why I still um, consider the application server as one of the biggest benefits of using um, Java Enterprise. Um, so first of all, talking about footprint, um, the footprint of all these heavyweight application servers is actually, well, not that true anymore. So if you... Um, especially since Java EE. So it was totally true in J2EE and all these big web sphere, forget, forget about them. But if you're using any modern Java EE7 application server, uh, whether it be Payara, whether it be uh, Wildfly, 
WebSphere Liberty Profile, not the old one, um, or Tommy, these start up very fast and deploy very fast. And that's actually an old computer. It would be much faster if you use a new machine. And it just starts and deploys in seconds, all these um, applications. But actually, servers. this is not specified. We don't have GS GCP for this. And every vendor has own approach how to uh, prepare this micro profile for each uh, server. And this is a big problem. For example, I cannot hot switch to another server from uh, Tommy E to uh, Whitefly. Swarm or yeah, um, well, the, yes, th that's probably true. So the idea was that you could actually switch from one server to, to another with the specification. In the real world, you're, you're right, you're, you probably can't that easily. But the, um, the compatibility is probably not like a guarantee that you could take any Java E application and deploy it somewhere else. But it's more like a life raft, you know? Because how often is it the, uh, the case that you have an enterprise project with a customer who relies, let's say, on IBM technology and constantly says, oh, now we want to redeploy on um, WebLogic, for example. But, but if you have to do, sorry, then it's a life raft that you don't have to rewrite your whole application from that because you were using the standards and you probably have to um, switch some custom configuration files and you're done. But it's break concept of Java that said uh, write once, run everywhere. Yeah, that's true. But um, you know, you never get that in any um, uh, kind of lightweight enterprise framework. So if you try to migrate from, from Spring to Java E or from Spring to um, Lagom, you know, you would have to re rewrite everything, and and all the um, annotations and 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 so on and so forth. And if you um, just migrate from, let's say, Wildfly to, to Tommy, and you have some custom configuration, of course, you would have to rewrite this, but that's uh, maybe like 5% of the enterprise project, and you don't have to rewrite all the other stuff if you're using just the standard. And with Java E7, this is definitely possible. And talking about application servers, um, so why uh, I would consider the, uh, this deployment model as, well, one of the best for, for the whole processes. So um, anyway, forget about the old world of application servers. The new application servers start up very fast. The um, download size is, well, not, not that much. So it's like 100 uh, megabyte. The memory footprint is, yeah, well, a little bit higher than the standalone jar approach. But it's also just, I don't know, a couple of uh, megabytes, maybe like uh, 100. I, I measured it before, but I've uh, uh, forgotten. Like, Funnily, it's less than a browser. So if you have a running Chrome instance, then it, that Chrome consumes more than a fully-fledged Java E application server now. And uh, for example, Tommy has a nice approach. So Tommy um, is based on Tomcat uh, with an embedded uh, OpenEJB container. So that's uh, how it started, and so on and so forth. And actually, you could use, uh, just use any uh, stock Tomcat and add this. Uh, it's, I think it's called Tommy Embedded to the libraries, and then you have a fully-fledged application server with not a big uh, overhead. So um, if you're more interested in that overhead uh, thing, um, uh, Google uh, Adam Bean, he has uh, recorded several videos showing the overhead of both application servers and actually also EJBs, so the overhead in footprint and in runtime. And as you will notice, there, it's not even, not almost not measurable, uh, the overhead here. And the same story is like, if you ask any um, ops guys um, if they have a really huge servers with a lot of RAM, then they mostly don't, don't care about you know, 10 megabyte RAM more or less. As opposed to that, it really gives you some benefits um, from the development and deployment model. And I'll show you why. And because of this, so what, what I've done here, um, I built the WAR file with that provided dependency from Java E7. And as you will see, this is very small because it's just uh, uh, containing all your business logic. Everything I just wrote, all the class files. I can um, actually show you. This WAR file contains only my classes I just wrote here, a bunch of class files and the WAR file description. And that's it because you as developers can rely on the API being there on the server. And this is actually one of the biggest benefits using this thin WAR file deployment approach because 
everything you are shipping all of the time. So you're developing, you know, you have to recompile and rebuild your application 100 times a day. And every time you're, you're shipping something, even when you're deploying, when you push to Docker and all that stuff, what you're shipping is very thin. You're always just changing a few kilobyte in size. As opposed to some standalone JAR approach or some other um, framework where you ship the runtime as well, you're always shipping all the few bytes back and forth uh, containing all your runtime. So for example, I, I have done a lot of Spring in, in the past, just to, to mention one, and we de were deploying on Tomcat, or if you're uh, using Spring Boot, then it's getting a, a lot better. It's just a few megabytes, you could argue. But still, you're always um, shipping megabytes uh, back and forth. Yes. But uh, this uh, born new limitation. For example, you cannot uh, use more modern library because your uh, container ships with oldest one. And you just cannot do this if you are not manage this container. It depends which container you're using. But at the same time, I would uh, argue, and this is the other topic of the, uh, of the dependencies, which dependencies you actually need if you're using Java E7 with, with Java 8. Because um, most of the time, if you look at most of the enterprise projects, and actually just my recent client project was really the case, they were using a lot of third-party dependencies, which you, <laughs> I would argue, don't need. Uh, actually, I said about enterprise uh, dependencies. For example, you just want uh, to uh, take more uh, newest version of uh, GSF library, for example, uh -huh. from 2.1 to 2.2. Uh, yeah. And you cannot because your enterprise container not support this version for now. Um, okay, if you need a new uh, version which is not there, then you can replace it on the server. It, yeah, it, de it depends on a, spe a specific use case. So sometimes, uh, obviously, you have some some issues where it, where, where it's not not possible. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes it, it's, it, it collides, that's, that's true. And then you would have to use a, a new um, version of your application server if, if that's the case. But um, going, going back to this um, approach, so why, you know, application servers are still a good approach to deploy the thing. Because, as I said, if you have a thin um, deployment layer, you're always shipping just a, a thin, you know, artifact. And actually, it doesn't even matter if, you're doing a, if you do a local deployment, because this is the reason why it was very fast to both build and deploy your whole thing, right? No matter if it's locally or if it's on your uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery server. Because the same story continues once you build that thing, no matter if it's just a WAR file being deployed, being pushed to Nexus, being deployed uh, over SSH to your uh, production server, or if you new use a new container-based approach like Docker. And funnily, Java E and the deployment model of uh, this thin WAR file approach is the best way of how to deal with Docker images. Because the way uh, Docker containers work, they have like copy on, um, copy on write uh, file system, and you cache each and every step you're building in your Docker container. And once you have a base image containing the operating system, containing Java, containing your application server, this thing gets then stored and cached, and this gets pushed to your company-wide um, Docker repository, right? And every time you build your project, you're always changing just the last layer. And using Docker, this is very fast, because you're also not rebuilding the whole operating system and the whole Java thing each and every time, right? And also, you should not rebuild your enterprise um, runtime each and every time, but just the thing you are uh, uh, writing and you are developing, like your enterprise project, your business code. And the story is we, as developers, should care about the business code, right? Not about all the implementations, about the low-level stuff, because at the end of the day, this is what cr uh, creates money and creates revenue from our project, right? Having business logic. And this is what we should care about. And Using this approach, you're just uh, changing the last layer. And no matter uh, where, on, on which level you are, if you do it locally on a CI server, if you do it to Nexus, or if you do it to Docker Hub, 
you're always just pushing a few kilobytes in size because this is what diffs to each and every version. So it could be on a train with um, crappy internet uh, over your phone and still deploy your application because it's just a few kilobytes, right? And this is actually why Java E works together with container technologies really, really well. Or actually, this approach, no matter if it's uh, Java E, but it's the only framework which has this thin um, deployment model approach because there is a runtime where it can rely on. And yeah, talking about this micro uh, profile initiative, so standalone jars um, got very um, well popular in the last time, and I'm running out of time, otherwise, I would just show you how to create one, but, well, spoiler alert, you just uh, uh, add a Maven plugin to create Wi-Fi Swarm, for example, if you want to have a standalone JAR approach together with Java EE, so it's definitely possible to do this. But um, why I'm talk uh, telling you this, you probably don't need a standalone JAR if you can manage your own runtime, right? So if you uh, work if, uh, in a DevOps environment or work with your operations team very closely and you can decide which application server to choose and so on and so forth. I would say um, from experience it's a nice workaround if you have some, I would say, non-technical and political problems. For example, if your operation team uh, doesn't have access to your application servers or can't switch that easily or you have some contracts with uh, big companies and you have to use this old version of that application server and so on and so forth and then you just say like you said yeah go with my jar file standalone approach please just run it and whatever and then as a workaround you can use um, um, an approach with a standalone jar like uh, Wildfly Swarm like Tommy Embedded and so on and so forth to ship your runtime as well but because of what I said before, I wouldn't consider this as the best approach like, to go if you have a choice. And MicroProfile is not only like a, a standalone, but it's basically if you, you can choose your, um, um, your specifications, and, uh, or uh, in other words, it's a thinner way of a Java E umbrella in, in, in short words. So um, it only includes a few specifications and not the full profile and definitely not all the legacy stuff we, we have to uh, ship around. And if you're interested in that, have a look at this, what is um, uh, what is included there. And it uh, will provide both a standalone jar and uh, a traditional application server based approach where you can run your um, enterprise projects. And in, if you're fine with having just a, this small subset of specifications, just go with it. But I would argue mostly you don't have to care um, that much. So do you have any questions or disagreement with this? All right. So um, I hope I could tell you a little bit uh, more about Java E. So now please um, do me two favors. So first of all, Please uh, stop calling Java EE uh, heavyweight. And uh, yeah, second, if you um, get the chance to vote for my session, then please tell me uh, by the app. I think it's possible. To, uh, please tell me whether you uh, like my session or not. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>